This is World Civilization. My name is Dr. Long. This video is entitled Classical East Asia and India. In China, the Zhou Dynasty increasingly became weak and collapsed in 256 BCE. It was then replaced by the short-lived Qin Dynasty, which ruled from 221 to 207 BCE. Now, despite their brief rule, the Qin were noted for unifying northern and southern China for the first time through a bloody war that, that, that their founder, Ying Xing, waged. The, the Qin also built roads and created the first bureaucracy in China. After the downfall of the Qin, a new dynasty came to power, the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty would rule from 202 BCE until 220 CE, thus lasting nearly 400 years. The name for ethnically Chinese people, the Han, came from the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty was also known for economic prosperity. Also, during the Han period, Emperor Wu, who ruled from 141 to 87 BCE, waged successful wars against nomadic steppe peoples in, in the north and particularly peoples in Central Asia. Emperor Wu also invaded and conquered parts of Vietnam. His wars resulted in great territorial expansion for China, and he's widely considered one of China's greatest emperors. Until the Han Dynasty, Confucianism had just been one among many schools of thought in China. However, under Emperor Wu, Confucianism became the ideology of the state. In many ways, China under the Han became the Confucian state. The elites especially embraced Confucianism. Under the Han, an examination system to enter the civil service that effectively ran the government for the emperor was created, with exams based on knowledge of classical Confucian text. Doing well on a civil service exam was highly prestigious in Han society. In the rankings of Confucian ideals, the scholar, the, the scholar government official who helped manage the state out of a sense of duty and honor was seen as the most honorable person in the highest calling in society. Next were farmers who fed the people, followed by artisans who made things. And at the bottom of Confucian ideals were merchants. This is ironic because it is under the Han that China became a major player in world trade through the Silk Road, which obviously involved merchants. The Silk Road was a major trade route that stretched from China and, and Central Asia all the way westward to the Roman Empire along the, along the Mediterranean Sea. Now, one of the things that made the Silk Road possible was the rise of four big Eurasian imp empires that participated to one degree or the other in the Silk Road. These four big empires in Europe and Asia, Eurasia, were Han China in the east, the Mauryan Empire, which unified most of India from 3, uh, 320 to 183 BCE in the south, the Parthian or Persian Empire in present-day Iran in the center, and the Roman Empire, uh, which, was, which was strong from 27 BCE to 476 CE, and the Roman Empire was in the west. China produced silk and lac lacquerware that it sold overland along the Silk Road in Central Asia. It was sold west even as far as the Roman Empire. And indeed, Chinese silk was popular among the Roman elites. India produced spices and jewels that it sold to the west. The trade route from India to the Roman Empire was a sea route, running from India, across the Indian Ocean, around Arabia, and to Egypt, along the Red Sea. Uh, Egypt itself was a Roman province. For its part, the Roman Empire paid for eastern products with gold and silver coins, and the outflow of precious metals to China bothered the Roman government. Roman, Roman coins have been found as far east as Japan, indicating the far reach of this Silk Road trading network. Now besides goods, global religions also circulated along the Silk Road. India was, ex was an especially important center of religion in the ancient world. India is an ancient civilization that first grew up around the Indus River Valley around, uh, around 3300 BCE. Between 800 and 200 BCE, Hinduism and Buddhism became imported in India. Now, Hinduism began before Buddhism. Hinduism spread through most of India and into other parts of Southeast Asia where Indians traveled. 
Hinduism believes that individuals go through a cycle of death and rebirth known as reincarnation, with one's karma or action determining one's future rebirth. In addition to the idea of reincarnation and karma, Hinduism has a religious caste-based system. Now for its part, Buddhism came out of Hinduism. The founder of Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama, or the Buddha, the enlightened one as he was called, lived around the 5th century BCE. Uh, he was a Hindu originally in northern India from the aristocratic warrior class. Buddhism shares the belief in reincarnation and karma with Hinduism. However, the Buddha rejected the caste system. In Buddhism, desire leads to suffering. The goal, therefore, is to end desire and break the cycle of death and rebirth and reach nirvana, a state of self-realization in which suffering and rebirth end. In both Hinduism and Buddhism, spiritual liberation is seen as ending the cycle of reincarnation. In India, King Ashoka, who ruled from 269 to 232 BCE, strongly promoted Buddhism. Buddhism spread in India under Ashoka. Buddhism also especially spread along the Silk Road. And Buddhism was one of the first major missionary religions, with monks and merchants taking it to other countries. For instance, Buddhism spread from India to Sri Lanka and then to Southeast Asia, including to Thailand and Vietnam. Buddhism also spread along the Silk Road to Central Asia. Some of the largest statues of the Buddha were constructed in what is now Afghanistan at this time, until the Taliban destroyed it in 2001. Also, under the Han Dynasty, Buddhism first came to China. Now at first, the Chinese found Buddhism both strange and fascinating. Above all, Confucian China was wary of Buddhism, seeing it as a foreign and possibly disruptive new religion. It took about 500 years for China to fully accept Buddhism as one of its own religious traditions. From China, Buddhism likewise spread to the rest of East Asia, first to Korea in the 4th century CE, and from Korea to Japan in the 6th century CE. By, by 623 CE, Japan had about 46 Buddhist temples. In 721 CE, the government in Japan ordered the construction of a Buddhist monastery and a nunnery in each province. In many ways, Japan actually became the most Buddhist state in East Asia, more, more Buddhist even than, Chi than Korea or China. Zen Buddhism, for instance, which stressed that enlightenment is beyond rational comprehension and is known for its riddles, first developed in Japan. In addition to Buddhism, Mon Monotheism also spread along the Silk Road. Monotheism was a religion founded by a Persian teacher, Mani. Monotheism fused per Persian religious beliefs such as Zoroastrianism with Greek philosophy. Monotheism is dualistic. It sees the world as starkly divided between a good spiritual realm and an evil physical world. Now, Monotheism was a minority of religions in all the places where it found adherents, but it spread as far west as North Africa and the Roman Empire where Augustine, who later became a major figure in Western Christianity, was a Monachian for 10 years. And then it spread as far east as China. The Monachians eventually died out due to Roman, Chinese, and, and, and Muslim persecution. But they are still an example of how religion spread and flourished across much of Eurasia along the Silk Road. Finally, Christianity spread along trade routes as well. Christianity came out of Judaism. As religion, Christianity teaches that Jesus is God incarnate, who died and rose again, obtaining forgiveness of offenses against God known as sin, and resurrection and everlasting life for those who believe. Christianity began in the Roman Empire in the first century CE. It spread within the Roman Empire despite persecution at the hands of the Roman state, until the, emperor, the, until the Roman Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity uh, in three, uh, 313 CE. From trade and political ties to the Roman Empire, Christianity also spread outside the Roman Empire to Armenia, where it became the state religion in 301 CE, and then to Ethiopia, where it became the state religion as well in 330 CE. An, offs an offshoot of the mainstream Christian church, uh, known as the Nestorian Church, also spread eastward to Mesopotamia and to Persia. By the 7th and 8th centuries, Nestorian Christianity has spread eastward along the old Silk Road 
to Afghanistan, China, and Mongolia. In addition to trade and religious beliefs, unfortunately, disease also spread along the Silk Road. During the third, second and third centuries, epidemics of bubonic plague, smallpox, and measles took huge tolls on populations, especially Han China and the Roman Empire. The rulers of the Han Dynasty eventually grew decadent. Peasant revolts and rebellious warlords led to chaos and the abdication of the last Han Emperor around 220 CE. From the 3rd through the 7th century CE, China experienced a period of infighting and division with 16 separate Chinese kingdoms. Likewise, the Roman Empire experienced civil wars and economic pro problems in the 3rd century CE, an invasion of the Huns and the Germanic tribes that led to, its, led to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in 476 CE. The Middle Ages then followed. The early Middle Ages, a period from 500 to 1000 CE, was known for a, for a division of multiple kingdoms and economic decline and warfare in Western Europe. Now between all the problems in Western Europe and China, trade along the Silk Road declined after the 3rd century CE, with fewer connections between the West and China, although as we shall see, they will revive later again. While Western Europe declined during the early Middle Ages, 500 to 1000 CE, China would recover in the 7th century under the brief Sui Dynasty, which would rule from 581 to 681 CE. The Sui Dynasty created an army of up to one million men that waged bloody wars, especially in the south, and then eventually reunified all of China's warring 16 states. The Sui Dynasty was followed by the Tang Dynasty, which ruled from 6, uh, 618 to 907 CE. Under the Tang Dynasty, the capital of China was Xi'an, which was much nearer to the center. The Tang Dynasty was very wealthy because of the trade along the Silk Road and very culturally cosmopolitan. Under the Tang, Nestorian Christianity reached China, and along with Manichaeism was tolerated, although both of them only attracted a minority of Chinese. As China was unified and wealthy under the Tang, Tang China was also noted for its roads and over 1,600 post stations. The Tang Dynasty also promoted Chinese culture, including poetry, which was considered of very high quality under the Tang. Literacy also increased under the Tang. The Tang Dynasty also greatly promoted Confucianism, including the construction of Confucian temples and reportedly over 19,000 schools. These schools created a series of degrees based on the presti prestigious Jinxi degree. Uh, Jinxi means present scholar. The Jinxi degree stressed both knowledge and traditional Chinese literature, as well as Confucian text. These were seen as a way uh, to, to, uh, to learn how to address relevant problems uh, and were seen as a requirement to hold public office. Other degree programs, however, emphasized rote memorization of Confucian text. One technique for the small percentage of children who were able to attend schools was called the backing of the book technique. In the backing of the book technique, pupils were expected to turn their back to their teacher and recite a portion of a Confucian text by memory. If the pupil did so perfectly, he was sent back to his test to memorize some more Confucian text. If he made a mistake, his teacher hit him on the back with a bamboo stick and ordered him to get, get back to his desk and study again. Now, education literacy certainly grew under the Tang, although most Chinese remained illiterate peasants. Still, under the Tang, the Confucian examinations and degree programs became necessary for entrance into the prestigious civil service work and government jobs. Beginning with the Tang and for hundreds of years afterwards, the elite in China were scholarly civil servants trained in the Confucian system. As such, the examination system came to have a huge place in Chinese society because it was seen as a ticket to respect and success. But only 1% of young men who took the civil service exams passed. So pressure to pass was intense, with young men studying for years to do so. Now, ironically, while Confucianism advocated ethical, honest behavior, the intense pressure to pass the civil service exams led to cheating. This included smuggling in answers on, in undergarments and in hiring impersonators to take the exam. So I suppose you could say some things never change with exams. 
The civil, civil exam system became so important in China under the Tang that it also spread to Korea, where a national academy to instruct Koreans in Confucian texts was established in, in 682 CE, followed by the first Korean civil service exams in 788. The Tang Dynasty eventually came to have military problems, especially in dealing with neighbors such as Tibet, Vietnam, and steppe peoples to the east and north of China, such as the Uyghurs in Central Asia and the Khitans in Mongolia and Manchuria. Also, an Arab army defeated the Tang in a major battle along the Tala River in 751, which allowed Islam to expand into Central Asia. This eventually led to a coup against the Tangs and the establishment of a new ruling dynasty in China, the Song Dynasty, which ruled from 960 to 1279 CE. The Song Dynasty continued the civil service exams, and under the Song Dynasty, Chinese ships traded on a regular basis with India, and even as far as the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. China also traded heavily with Japan. Internally, under the Song, China began a massive canal system, which at its completion stretched over 11,000 miles long, linking the city of Beijing in the north to the southern city of Hangzhou in the south. This canal system was especially important to China under the Song and helped its economy grow and urbanize. Under the Song, China was by far the wealthiest and most important nation in the world, with perhaps up to one-third of the population in China by the 10th century. In terms of cities, the urban population of, of China under the Song may have been equal to the entire urban population of the rest of the world combined. Thus, while the Silk Road had connections that existed between Western Europe under the Roman Empire and China under the Han, and these connections did not revive until after 1000 CE, China, for its part, certainly recovered. This is especially the case under the, Ta the Tang and Song dynasties. After the Song dynasty was conquered by the Mongols, global connections and trade would take another turn. Still, the rise of, of the first trade from Europe to China along the Silk Road illustrates that globalization is not a modern phenomenon. It, is, it was very lively and important in Eurasia along the Silk Road in ancient times, and especially had roots in classical China and India. The human web, thus, is not a modern phenomenon. I will stop with this observation. Thanks for watching.